as we start the program, we just encourage everyone to please put yourself on mute. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and Leslie, take it away. Everybody, and welcome to the kickoff keynote for the Columbia Alumni with Disabilities Shared Interest Group. My name is Leslie A. Zucker, and I am a 2023 graduate of Columbia Journalism School. I didn't get diagnosed with autism until the spring before I entered grad school three years ago when I was 36 years old. It was frustrating not to understand such an integral part of my identity for so much of my life. I cannot begin to describe how lonely it was as an undergraduate at a West Coast liberal arts college trying to navigate both my social life and academics um, as an undiagnosed autistic person. I started the Columbia Alumni with Disabilities to unite disabled Columbia graduates and our allies, to support Columbia students with disabilities, and to ensure that community members have the resources they need so that they won't have the same experience that I do. Lying awake at night at nearly 40 years old, wondering how much more I would have accomplished if only the infrastructure had existed to give me the proper network, supports, and diagnoses so that I could have reached my full potential much earlier in my life. I hope you will join us at the Columbia Alumni with Disabilities in supporting this generation and future generations of Columbia students and alumni with disabilities. Now to introduce today's speaker. Jennifer Brunton, PhD, 06 GSAS, is the co-author, along with Jenna Jensik, MA, of the Actually Autistic Guide to Advocacy, step-by-step -step advice on how to ally and speak up with autistic people and autistic in the autism community, and the Actually Autistic Guide to Building Independence, a handbook for teens, young adults, and those who care about them. Every topic in these empowering and affirming books was chosen, shaped, and informed by perspectives and insights from more than 100 actually autistic people. Brunton consults around neurodiversity inclusion and regularly gives keynotes and other talks, workshops, and classes based on these books. Brunton holds a doctorate in sociology from Columbia University. At Columbia, she was a fellow throughout her many years of graduate school based on the quality of her academic work, but struggled to navigate departmental dynamics. She decided early on that she wanted to be a community college professor, both to teach underserved students and to be in a presumably less difficult environment. She then spent 10 years teaching ethics, bioethics, religion and philosophy at the Community College of Vermont while working as a freelance editor on Fulbright proposals and academic books. In 2016, she pivoted to full-time editing and writing. Jennifer has written and edited for some of the most distinguished names in publishing, including Content Anovo, Guidehouse, Forbes, Random House, and Mirabella. She collaborated with Carlos Davidovich, MD, on Five Brain Leadership, how neuroscience can help you understand your team, master your instincts, and become a better leader. She has also owned her own yoga centers and real estate businesses and wrote a literary mystery under a pen name. In her free time, she loves to paint, hike, and practice yoga. The autistic parent of an autistic son and a neurotypical daughter, Jennifer is, Jennifer is passionate about making the world a better place for people who think, learn, and experience life in unique ways. Her parenting blog, Full Spectrum Mama, has been advancing civil rights for all with a focus on neurodiversity and intersectionality for more than 10 years. Without further ado, let us welcome Jennifer Brunton to the kickoff keynote of the Columbia Alumni with Disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Leslie. Um, that was very heartfelt and all of the things that you said I hope will be somewhat addressed in this talk because that's, you know, that's what we're really looking for, right? Is that people get what they need throughout their lifespan, not just suddenly, <laughs> and that there's more acceptance, awareness, all of it. So um, thank you so much, Leslie, and thanks for starting this organization. And thank you all for attending. And thank you, Jenna and Mari, for um, handling the details on this and uh, for welcoming to me to the inaugural gathering of Columbia Alumni with Disabilities. I am um, I frequently actually uh, use Columbia as an example 
in my work um, and my talks, um, especially when I talk about professional paradigms and institutions, um, I received my doctorate or earned my doctorate at Columbia in the old white male days of the sociology department, which that was not that long ago, but in the um, sort of mid 2000s. Um, and I hope that a lot of things have changed since then. Um, I did have an incident when um, Columbia Magazine was going to publish an article on my first book and um, my work. And they decided that month that there wasn't enough room for two articles about autism. So they published instead a piece on um, literally the title, the original title had a, some, a phrase, something like um, how to, um, they're basically trying to eradicate autism. <laughs> So, or prevent autism. So it was some research that was being done, I think at the medical school and it was, um, they were tr looking at the factors that lead to autistic people being born and how to avoid them. So we kind of had it out uh, about that and they did publish the piece about me and my work in the next one, in the next issue um, with my very candid responses to what they had done there. So, um, so, Thank you for being here and hopefully this will be helpful um, on a couple different levels. So I know that I'm here to inspire you, but I'm going to start kind of rough. Um, we're living in a pretty chaotic, broken world. There's a lot of political chaos. There's a climate crisis. There's um, war in Gaza. There's economic injustice. And we've depleted our resources and mistreated each other. And we're very, very polarized right now. Um, we barely made it through a global pandemic. Um, and Colombia itself is facing a lot of internal strife and violence and mutual disrespect um, with and the resignation of the president. There's so much going on right now. And it feels like there's been a real decline in truth and collaboration and consensus and mental health, even along with the rise out in the open of populism and nationalism homophobia, ableism, racism, transphobia, misogyny, some of these things are 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 in the public discourse in a way that I never could have imagined 10 years ago. And this makes even less room at the table in some ways for marginalized people as this world kind of self-destructs. So um, we really need new ways of thinking, right? Um, slide, please. So the answer of whether we need new ways of thinking is clearly yes, right? We desperately need innovative perspectives to generate new ways of caring for the earth and each other. And who has these new and different ways of thinking? People who have experienced the world a little differently, I would say, particularly people with differences in disabilities. I work, um, most of my work focuses on neurodivergence. Obviously neurodivergent people have different ways of thinking. People with life experience that, um, can build empathy, can build iconoclastic thinking, can build um, insights into different ways to navigate the world and come up with better solutions, right? So why do we as a society and at times Columbia as a university marginalize and invalidate people whose bodies and brains are built or wired differently? Why do we not meet their most basic needs or support their dreams? I think that part of that is that institutions and cultures have a vested interest in the status quo if they're benefiting from it, right? They don't want to change things, even if the world is kind of going to hell in a handbasket, as my grandmother used to say. And I think that a lot of people who are succeeding in their day-to-day -day life in the world exactly as it is uh, can be intimidated or afraid of diverse ways of thinking and being, right? So um, they could be scared of very gender expressions and identities, or they people who don't buy into current political and societal systems and norms, or people who you know want more, right? But in, in this gathering, I hope we know that just because people think differently or move differently or um, process differently from the mainstream doesn't mean that they're wrong, right? History can give us many examples of this. So we know that we need to uplift and affirm people with divergent minds and other differences and disabilities and different experiences, amplify their ideas, nurture their capacities so that we can and all together flourish as human beings, contribute our unique gifts 
and even quite possibly help save this world, which is having some issues right now. Um, slide, please. So no pressure, but um, um, disabled people uh, are able to bring something new to the table. So I'm welcoming all of you and with the hopes that you can do, continue to do that starting here or starting before this, that you'll be inspired to um, act on some of the change that is needed in the world. So um, I'm Jennifer Elizabeth Brunton. I was assigned female at birth. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the co-author, like Leslie said, of these two actually autistic guides. Um, the, mo the recent one actually is just about to come out is um, something that my co-author and I felt was really needed in the world, which is the actually autistic guide to building independence. So we spoke with or interviewed or um, or had surveys with more than 100 autistic young people and adults and teens um, to talk about all the different elements of life that are really important to them. And um, in terms of autonomy and independence and interdependence and get got all of their insights from their life experience around those matters. So I'm here to talk about how we can work together to evolve mindsets and cultures and environments based on the principles and practices that I've gleaned from this many years of research into the experiences and insights of hundreds of neurodivergent people. So the prior, the previous book was also based on um, insights from more than 100 autistic people. I also come from a multiply intersectional perspective in a, mul a majority of color, disabled, queer family with a wide variety of neurotypes and uh, quirks and all sorts of stuff. We're we're quite a um, we're quite a bunch, but um, nonetheless, I can still only speak from my own life experience as an autistic, queer, chronically ill person. So each of you brings your own ways of being, wisdom, and life journey, and I honor every one of you. And I thank you again for attending. Um, this is a safe space. This Zoom is a safe space for all of us to be our whole unmasked selves. And that means please feel free if you're on screen to fidget or stim or take a break or whatever you need. Um, all of that is welcome here. Um, slide, please. So today, I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about my journey as a disabled autistic person. Um, next, I'll discuss why allies matter and um, in this process of changing policies and, um, and practices in the larger world. Um, after that, I'll talk about concrete ways people of all abilities can live a more inclusive paradigm in daily life. And then I'm going to look take a little bit of a deep dive into professional allyship, especially as related to um, Inst uh, well, self-advocacy and allyship, right? Especially as it's related to an institutional context. Um, I'm gonna pause between each of these sections to uh, to see if there are any clarification questions. Like, was there a word I used that wasn't clear or um, something like that, or uh, a concept that wasn't clear? And you can either unmute yourself and ask the question live then, or you can go to the chat. And I believe that Jenna, is going to be moderating the chat because that's a little too much for me <laughs> with all the different things, but please feel free to um, do that in the chat or live. And I'll I'll mention when I'm doing that. And I'll do that a couple of times, like between each section. And then at the, right before the end, like about five minutes before I'll finish talking, I'll do a more extensive substantive Q and A um, to discuss any kind of topics that came up for you during this talk. Um, Throughout the talk, I will always speak from what's called a social model of disability perspective. This means that we are all whole and perfect just as we are, exactly as we are, but certain factors such as attitudes, physical environments can be disabling to us if we have differences from what's considered the norm or the mainstream. And this model that I'm speaking from calls always for change in the disabling factors, not the people who are disabled thereby. Um, slide, please. So here's me, right? The 70s and the 80s actually saw some pretty radical disability activism um, and I think made a lot of a huge difference in li lives moving forward. But where I grew up, which was in Westport, Connecticut, everything was already just perfect, right? Everyone was rich. Everyone was neurotypical, athletic, well-dressed, and preppy. And then there was me. Um, 
we're told that neurodivergence is an invisible disability, but people do sense our differences and we sense them ourselves. We're often othered or treated as less than because of them. And this manifests in many different ways, right? So when I was a little girl, my sensory challenges, my migraines, my really, really deep focus on certain topics, my being in my own world, being bullied, all of those things were blamed on me being extra smart. And I knew I wasn't interacting like the other AFAB girls my age, but I was completely and utterly baffled by what the differences were or what I should do to change it. Um, but I tried really, really hard. Slide, please. For example, I became a punk rocker, but I made a fluffy mohawk instead of like the pointy mohawk that you're supposed to do, I guess. But um, I had to expend a million times more energy than anyone else to do any kind of physical activity. That was one area where I really struggled. And nobody believed I was actually struggling. Um, and I only realized when my son had the same challenges um, that low muscle tone had made exercise much, much harder for me. Um, and low vagal tone meant I had a lot of shutdowns and meltdowns. Uh, I quickly learned to hide meltdowns that wasn't really acceptable in my family upbringing. But whatever was quote unquote wrong with me made everything harder. Um, there was never any idea of accommodating or adapting or accepting anything. Um, so I think that things have shifted recently. Um, slide, please. We have a lot more unity and momentum now than when I was, I think, like a teenager and young adult um, around around civil rights, right? So we do live in scary times, but there's really unprecedented activism going on um, from Black Lives Matter to trans rights to climate crisis activism. And how do we come together and participate meaningful in the, me, sorry, excuse me, meaningfully in this powerful wave of activism? How can we all be sure we're putting our energies into truly affirming ideas and projects and actions? So let's start by defining some important terms, okay? Um, a self-advocate is someone from a marginalized population who makes efforts to reduce discrimination, access spaces, opportunities, adaptations, and or accommodations, and or achieve their goals or basic rights as a human being. An advocate is someone who fills a similar role for someone in a marginalized population. For example, a parent of a young child um, or someone who uh, advocates for a marginalized population in general. An ally is someone who works alongside and with a marginalized person or group. So not for them, not doing something for them, but with them, guided by their, um, with their guidance. And then an accomplice is someone who will kind of flat out take the hit for you, right? So um, slide, please. So... Um, Allyship becomes really important for a lot of reasons. Um, a neuroaffirming ally or a disability affirming ally honors and centers the perspectives and goals of the disabled person or group they're allying with. So disabled people with certain privileges or skills can also be allies. And I often am. I mean, if we're we're here, at, we all have this affiliation with Columbia. So we obviously have some privileges that many people don't. So we might also be allies as well as self-advocates or advocates. Um, we need allies, though, too, as some of what I will show to share today will show. Um, so I live in very radical, unconditional acceptance, and I believe that we should adapt environments, attitudes, policies, et cetera, to each unique person. But I understand that many disabled people may want to grow and learn and adapt on their in their own ways. But the problem arises when others try to make changes in our bodies, our brains, our ways of being, our lives, our environments, without our consent, desire, or input, rather than adapting environments and attitudes and interactions to our needs and goals. So allies get this, right? They avoid ableism. They presume competence and equality. And they put the needs and dreams of the person or people they're allying with first. Slide, please. We especially need allies, and I always speak above all to uh, neurodivergent and otherwise disabled people, um, but we do need allies because we often have less power and privilege and fewer mainstream friendly skills at times. So if you're not 
disabled, you obviously have certain advantages in the world as it, it stands right now. And as well, we disabled people only have so many spoons. So just existing in an able normative world uses a lot of our spoons. Um, I have a friend, Ezra, who uses a Ginger Rogers analogy. He says, we have to do everything that able-bodied people do in the dance of life, but backwards and in heels. Yet most people don't really have the slightest clue about what it costs us to function in a world that's not designed for us. With all that we're carrying and taking care of our taking care of our well-being sometimes means not also carrying all the responsibility for change. So that's where our allies and accomplices can come in. Um, slide, please. So one place that we do need allies is higher education. Um, a study from UMass Amherst noted that 20% or one fifth of college students have disabilities, but it found that uh, a mere 3% of those college students or roughly one in seven of those disabled students is registered with disability services and receiving services. So that means that the vast majority of disabled college students are likely receiving no support. That's close to um, a fifth of all college students. So how much of that unfair lack of access stems from a lack of awareness because disability is not prioritized by schools? And how much of it stems from negative perceptions and othering around disability? And how much from a lack of spoons? Allies can help change this, right? Like other powerful and necessary movements, disability rights are at the forefront of civil rights. And when you ally and stand with us, or when you join those affinity groups, or when you ask for more decency from the institutions that you participate in, as an ally, you carry some of our weight. You say no to marginalization and shame and othering. And you increase access and acceptance by helping to evolve places, policies, and cultures, and people even. Uh, as my friend John Elder Robeson, who's an um, author and a public figure, says, over history, disability accommodations become mainstream expectations. Slide, please. So what privileges and abilities brought you to Columbia, right? And how might you use those advantages to ally with, uplift, and empower others, as well as as a self-advocate? Genuine allyship entails collaborating to nurture growth and progress. And we can all deploy our power, privilege, and skills to advance fundamental civil rights and justice for all, so that disabled people can flourish as human beings on an equal playing field, with enough spoons to contribute their much needed and invaluable gifts to this world. Um, I'm gonna pause for clarification questions now. Um, if anyone has any, you can either um, unmute or put them in the chat. And if, if we don't, we can just move on to um, the next section. Does anyone have questions? I'm just curious, what, what can those of us who are autistic and self-advocates, what can we do as Columbia graduates, or even those of us who are current students, you know, to use our privilege in sort of the, you know, non, um, non Columbia world, what are, do you have actions that we could take? I'd love to know. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that is a more substantive question, but I'll, I'll, I can begin to tackle it now. I'm going to actually talk a lot about that in a little bit. Um, but I would say that, um, we can do there like whatever you're comfortable with, especially as an autistic person. I myself, um, I have sometimes found it hard. I mean, I find public speaking very challenging, but I find it hard sometimes to uh, interact verbally with people. So I might, you know, um, I might uh, say write to someone. I've written medical offices. I've written to schools. I've written to newspapers. You know, things like that. You you might have different strengths around. Um, you know, you might rather speak verbally or you might rather create artwork or things like that. But I do think that with a Columbia degree, um, you do have that little bit more of leverage to use. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm going to be talking about this so much later about different um, shifts we can make in the way we proceed as professionals or as people. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll talk um, more about that. And I'm, I'm also going to give you my email for people who have questions that I don't get to answer in depth. We had one question come in on the chat that says, could you clarify what having a spoon means? Oh, oh, sorry about that. Okay, so the spoon, there's, there's something called like a, I don't know if it's called like the spoon model or whatever, but the idea is that everybody has a certain amount of spoons every day and that people that disabled people um have to use their spoons just to do to function in this mainstream ableist world it takes us way more spoons so we have fewer spoons than people who are not disabled and and so it's um i have in my picture you know like um it it might for example for me as an autistic person like some of the sensory things that i have to do to get ready in the morning, like those use a lot of my energy. And then I have fewer spoons and then I have to interact with someone and that takes spoons. And then, you know, if you have a, a different disability, you might have to use other spoons, but we have to use more spoons. I mean, you could also just call it energy or, you know, um, vim and vigor, like what you have gets used up much more. Um, you get much more depleted when you're trying to function in an ableist world that isn't really designed for you. Um, there's a lot of information out there on that, but thank you for, for letting me clarify the basics of it. Anything else before we move on? Um, you mentioned some challenges, but I'm wondering about any advantages um, as an autistic individual. You mentioned like oh, you're yeah. more, you're great at that you prefer writing or you're great at writing and you obviously yeah. have two books yeah. out yes. and you did your PhD. Yes. Could absolutely. you talk more about your strengths? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like um, I'm writing a blog post about this right now for our publisher. Like my my brain is really pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I, I've been able to sort of navigate and figure out a lot of things with this brain that, um, you know, that other people can't, you know, I can do math in my head. I was the only student that anyone knew of in my cohort um, who got an A plus in statistics. The only reason I didn't pursue that was because I was really doing it all in my head. You know, I, so I definitely have tons of strengths. Yeah. And so I was able to like, and this is something, I'll, again, another thing I'll talk a little bit more about later, but I was able to really excel in my, um, in my doctoral studies. And I got really prestigious research grants and stuff like that. Um, I was able to really excel because of my academic strengths that I think have like a, a lot of um, autistic people will say, and I, this speaks to me that my, my strengths are very strong. They're stronger than way my, my academic strengths, for example, like a million billion times stronger than the average person. But then I, you know, might not be able to recognize you if I don't know you well, you know, so it, it's, I'm just, I have a lot, I don't have like a sort of medium level of anything. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely, I, I feel, um, and I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, like I feel I'm very proud of who I am and um, who my son is and all of the autistic people I know, I wouldn't have them any other way. I wouldn't have myself any other way, but there were a lot of things that like when I was at Columbia that I didn't really understand. So the way that I was successful was through doing exceptional work. I was not um, very deferential to the faculty and things like that, which I'll talk about later, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, those I think are some of my biggest strengths for sure. And I so think- So mirroring some like really strong academic and intellectual yeah. strengths, but maybe yeah. a lack of guidance, especially around things like integrate, like support around like prosopagnosia or facial or things like right, that. Right, right, right. Yeah, so right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Was there a- a chat question or something, or should I? Okay, all right, I'll move on. So, um, nothing so else in the chat. What? Nothing, nothing else. In chat. Okay, great. Thanks, Jenna. Um, so I've talked about why allies are important and necessary, and also that can include self advocates and disabled people can also, of course, be allies, especially those of us with certain privileges. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about coming together as self advocates and allies to advance inclusion and build community and leading toward interdependence that uplifts and affirms people with disabilities, as well as um, it, in, a, in the sense of um, both independence in the way that we can achieve autonomy, achieve our own goals and dreams, but also interdependence. Like 
Um, there are a lot of things about the world that we take for granted that are in, that are interdependence that's designed for people who are um, who are typical or mainstream, such as, you know, we have roads, we have banks, we have um, public schools, you know, we have all of those things. Those are all interdependence things like they are things that help people. Right. But disabled people don't necessarily have the same kinds of um, available interdependencies that we need. So that's something that I'm gonna talk about next. Um, so slide, please. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so in the next sections, I'm gonna share a couple, some examples from my life and research to illustrate fully inclusive approaches that reflect truly affirming values. Um, I'll often begin by depicting uh, situations that uh, reflect non-inclusive behavior, but also talk about how um, there are concrete extrapolatable improvements based on affirming principles and mindsets for self-advocacy and allyship in daily life. Um, slide, please. So one great evolution we can start with, and we one of the people who asked a question kind of touched on what I was about to talk about in this one, is um, not assuming that everyone knows all the rules. And again, my work really focuses on neurodivergence, but with you know one in five people being neurodivergent, then then a lot of this stuff is very helpful. And then I'll it's also helpful for others as well. Like a lot of this stuff is kind of universal de design stuff that will actually help everybody. So um, not assuming everybody knows all the rules could be extremely helpful for many, many people. Um, as with many neurodivergent people who experience and perceive the world a little bit differently, not understanding unspoken rules and social codes, um, many of which are often obvious to neurotypical people, that has made my life exponentially harder. I've never had issues with getting good grades, as we, as I was just saying, so long as they were based on my work and tests. But in graduate school at Columbia, um, which I think is very typical of so much of academia, a lot of how you um, succeeded in the department depended on deference and unspoken social codes. And I think I missed a lot of opportunities during grad school, although at the time I had absolutely no idea. So I, um, I self-diagnosed in my 20s when I read a book about um, a, an autobiography of an autistic person, and then I was diagnosed in my 30s. But I really hadn't developed, even though I already suspected that I was autistic. Um, I hadn't developed like any tools around it when I was in graduate school. So I didn't really know what that meant in terms of what for me in terms of what was going wrong in that department. Um, I also don't always agree with neurotypical customs. So it just would have been nice to have been made aware of those unspoken codes of behavior because then I would have had a choice. Um, and I think that if self-advocates and allies in organizations and institutions and programs and friend groups even. My daughter is um, neurotypical and she is a social genius. She's so brilliant at navigating interactions with others and stuff. And she's, because she grew up with an autistic brother and mother, like she has come to notice when um, there are people in her social groups who aren't quite getting the norms and she will just she will say things like oh you know we do this or you know but not in a way of saying that you have to do this or that you have to conform but just to let people know like oh that's a joke you know because she's used to doing that with us oh that's a joke oh okay you know not in a condescending way but just in a in a way that it's just part of the fabric of what you do you know if i had come into um Columbia and there had been some kind of, you know, get together where we talked about what, how to navigate the, the hierarchy of that department or something like that it would have been so helpful for me. Um, if, if we would have an expectation that the rules get explained as sort of a part of the initial experience um, for new students, for new employees, um, not just, you know, just taking it into a bigger picture, not just Columbia, you know, group members and so on. And what if those rules and expectations were as a basic um, groundwork, right? They would be affirming and uh, empowering and adaptive, right? So, 
that can happen if you have intersectional employee and intersectional peer participation in the process of figuring out how to share and express those rules and expectations. And that would also make it just and effective, right? So not only would this benefit neurodivergent people like me, um, who had no idea what was going on, you know, like just didn't play that game at all. Um, but it would also benefit international students. Um, I remember there was a student in my department who really floundered, um, who had gone to a community college and wasn't really familiar with the whole Ivy thing, right? So, I mean, there are a lot of people who I think would benefit from um, clear rules and expectations. Um, slide, please. So, um, Here's another example of where we can make a huge difference. So I hope this is beginning to speak to that person who asked questions about like practical things you can do. So um, cultures are, can, you know, run a whole spectrum from very welcoming and inclusive to not so much at all. Um, I meet with a lot of disabled and neurodivergent student groups. And I've been struck by how students have very different concerns at, um, at different colleges. So there's one, college that I talk about sometimes, and I hope that it has improved quite a lot, but I have met with students recently um, where students are primarily concerned with how to navigate their current school situation. Um, they talk about isolation. They talk about professors not being respectful or accommodating, difficulties with policies and environments, um, a lack of allies, and resistance to self-advocacy on campus. And it's very heartbreaking. Um, there's other colleges that I talk about and, and talk to. Um, one in particular is the college that I went to as an undergraduate, which is Bryn Mawr, where students, when I meet with student groups there, they want to talk about the world after school. And they ask things like, they ask about preparing for job interviews and choosing a field where they would be accepted and able to thrive at, no matter their disability, that might, maybe even their intersectionality would be celebrated. And so students at the latter schools, um, they feel comfortable as neurodivergent humans or disabled humans um, on a diverse and actively welcoming campus. So it this culture of inclusion and allyship is something that can be very pervasive so the the school that I the first school that I'm talking about is a school that has taken steps toward inclusivity, but it feels like compliance and not heartfelt social justice. Um, and that's schools like that or institutions like that, like most institutions these days are are compliant with some DEIA rules and regulations and things like that. But I think that there needs to be a lot of times like some comprehensive cultural work to evolve, right? Whereas Bryn Mawr and some of these other schools where the students are looking forward, right? They've done that work. Self-advocacy is welcome. Allyship is kind of like a way of life. And you can really just feel it. Um, so I would ask you to consider for a minute um, what where your experience with Columbia fits in um, with that sort of continuum there. Um, you know, do you, if you have ideas for evolution or suggestions, um, you might consider sharing those with um, Leslie or me or the people, uh, there are many different offices and clubs and groups at Columbia and Barnard that you could uh, reach out to and maybe do a little work for or collaborate with or just a little bit of support, or if you're currently at Columbia, you know, what, are, what do you need to feel um, affirmed, included, and able to accomplish what you set out to accomplish at Columbia, right? Th these are, um, I think that Columbia is one of the schools that, um, that does make efforts, but I think there's, there's room for growth for sure at Columbia. Um, so, just thinking about something areas where you might um, reach out or or ask for what you need, and hopefully get a response that would be uh, affirming and empowering. Um, so let's see. So slide, please. So here's a a painful example of how not to be an ally. Right, I had a a writing group for a very long time and. Um, that I wrote my blog with. And 
after my children were, my blog was originally sort of like a parenting blog, but over time it became, as my kids got older and they were like, mom, don't write about us. So I stopped, <laughs> um, even though it was semi-anonymous. Um, I started writing a lot more about neurodivergence and disability and intersectionality. And my writing group didn't agree with myself or my psychiatrist who diagnosed me that I was autistic. And they started to give me like a really hard time all the time for being, um, for writing about being autistic. And, um, and then they started, when I started becoming um, involved in professional paradigms and trying to shift the way that um, neurodivergence is sort of medicalized and pathologized, um, there were only two other people in the group, but one of them had been a, a licensed clinical social worker. And she um, told me in literally the same sentence, she said that I wasn't really autistic, but then she said that I was thinking that I knew more than professionals, just like autistic people do. And what I was trying to do was um, to suggest that neurodivergent people should have a voice in the way um, neurodivergence is approached in various professions. So that was um, not so great, but it really made me think about what not to do, but also what to do. Like for many of us, our, our differences and disabilities or neurodivergence are a, a, a fundamental constitutive facet of our identity. And so as self-advocates and as allies, I think it's really important to honor those identities um, and not ever um, give, you know, suggestions of like how someone can get more like normal people or how someone really isn't what they say they are. Like, like just honoring people's identity is, is so fundamental, but it doesn't always happen as much as we might hope. So um, slide, please. So when we do honor each one another's identities, then we are able to um, be more resilient, right? When you feel seen and honored as who you are in your full being, then you're really able to, um, to move forward toward the forms of independence, accomplishment, and interdependence that you're really looking to, to achieve, right? So making sure that when we actively honor our own and others' identities, we can support the resiliency we need for dealing with day-to-day -day life as we discuss the, um, you know, we can build spoons in this way and we can, um, accomplish more of what we want to accomplish in a world that is often disabling to us. Um, slide, please. Thank you. So self-advocates and allies and Columbia community, um, how do we avoid the pitfalls that I was just talking about? Um, starting with these important strategies, right? So try to incorporate or expect affirming values and behaviors and materials in any context. Like consider this your moment to like know that you have really a, an ethical right to what you need in, in these contexts, including the institutional Columbia context, where you often may need to fight for that. And there may be people who will ally with you to do that if you need that. Um, so that means assuming, not just knowing that it sometimes happens, but actively assuming that people learn and process and move and experience life in different ways. So we adapt our actions, our mindsets and our environments accordingly. And both being fully accepting and honoring people's ways of being and communicating while also being explicit about rules and expectations and making sure that those rules and expectations are just, right? So one of the things I often thought about when I look back to graduate school is if, if we decided to just illuminate what those rules and expectations are in an institutional setting, I think that would also shed light on whether or not those rules and expectations were just, right? So, so that's another facet of this. Number two, remember that being disabled is not the problem, right? 
this was a huge theme in our research. Um, and I think my example of the two very different student groups shows. So the two particular institutions that I was kind of like condensing into those examples, they're both um, absolutely selective top tier schools. But in one of them, students are having a hard time functioning in that institution. And then the other one, which I, I was focusing on Bryn Mawr, um, they're, they're not, they're thriving in that institution. And these students have the same disabilities, basically. Like I'm talking mostly to neurodivergent students. Um, my, my most recent book that's coming out this month about building independence, um, my, my daughter just started at Bryn Mawr and she's made a couple of very close friends and she made them online before she arrived. And then they actually clicked when she arrived. And um, one of them is autistic. And I I thought, well, it's our, our new book has a whole, it, it kind of goes from like the micro, like family, individual stuff. And then it goes into high school, then it goes into college. And then it's like employment, housing, like all those practical things. But I thought she probably doesn't really need it right now because being autistic at Bryn Mawr is, um, is, really an example of where of number two where the environments and attitudes are so affirming that she may not really need any um insights or practical advice or tools so much until she gets out into the workplace and that's a whole nother thing so um number three so practicing acceptance and honoring people's identities there it's not um it's not affirming to offer people an assessment of their status or identity or ask people to prove their status or identity is actually quite offensive. Um, and it's okay to let people know that as well. You know, that's something that we need to, as disabled people, like not feel like we're being inconvenient when we say something like that, or we express that. Um, so number four, know that disabled people encounter multiple obstacles in our daily lives. So, um, disability friendly allies can help us stay resilient in that context. Number five, please avoid stereotyping since each of us has unique needs, abilities, disabilities, and more. And number six, overall, it's really about a culture of acceptance where each of us feels safe to be our whole selves and knows that our needs will be uh, honored, not because they're special, but just as literally as a matter of course. And these practices will actually help create access and resiliency and well-being for everybody who is in a culture or environment or institution that's being sort of shifted in this direction. Um, slide, please. So I know that's a ton of information and we still have um, another section to go after this, but all of these practices have something in common. And I think of it as like the intersectional golden rule for daily living. I've been, um, ever since I knew I was autistic and then I knew my son was autistic, you always hear like autistic people lack empathy. And that is so, so, so not true. We have a lot of feelings, <laughs> believe me. And we just don't always exactly catch how other people feel. And so, um, you should, the part of the intersectional golden rule is like, do what we do. So if you want to think, act, or interact in an affirming way, but aren't sure how, you can ask the people involved, um, but we don't always have the spoons to teach everybody. So, you know, it. you can also do some thinking and research and then extrapolate, right? How might this disabled person feel? How do I feel in this situation and how can that be honored? Um, you know, empathy, basically. So um, uh, slide, please. Um, so I'm going to pause again for clarification questions, but I want to tell one little story. So in the back of your mind, if you want to think about that. So um, I was talking about this idea of the um, intersectional golden rule, and someone told me a story that some of you may have heard about um, how there was a snowstorm I, this might just be sort of a little folktale, but it, it's really illustrative. Um, there's a snowstorm at a school and they the students saw that the, the person who was shoveling was shoveling the ramp first before the stairs. And they said, well, how come you're um, shoveling the ramp before the stairs since only one person needs the ramp? And the person says, but everybody can use the ramp. 
right? So it's like all, all of these changes that we're looking for will really lift up everyone. So any clarification questions? So Alice um, has her hand raised. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was wondering about two things. You mentioned, so you're talking about your daughter's friend at Bryn Mawr. Yeah. And about how that's a safe space. And I'm wondering about, but, you know, that it wouldn't be a safe space. When she, it might it be more challenging once she gets into the workplace. Yeah. Um. I'm wondering about the like networking and like the support, like the support in building a network and finding employment for students at the different colleges you've mentioned. Yeah. Uh, or even like some of the experiences of some Columbia students around that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I'm because I've interviewed uh, neurodivergent like employers. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm not sure what the question is. So, so both of those schools that I'm talking about have extensive networks, yes. And I think, I don't know um, if there, I, I, I think that there may be facets of those where they are trying to affirm and empower disabled people, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not super knowledgeable about that. My area of expertise is more in the realm of like, what are some practical steps you can take to find lines of work that are that might that might help you thrive that might or you know workplaces things like that but i think i mean i think that there are networks and i think that that is um i think that that's definitely evolving i think that's a, a really good point that 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 would be something to lean in on but i guess what i was pointing to more um more significantly was the fact that in one of the schools that i'm looking at the people are the students are more focused on how to even get through school right and so i'm trying to say that um you know here's a school where people feel so empowered and affirmed because there's a culture of inclusion a culture of allyship and self-advocacy that's that's very um really just super empowering to people with all kinds of differences and disabilities um and then there's other schools where that's not happening and how do we get those cultures um, but I think that, yeah, I think that networking, and I think that actually, I mean, you know, not to put more pressure on Leslie, I already suggested that people reach out to her for something else, but like an organization like this could also like this group that Leslie has started could be the kind of place where, you know, you can have kind of a, a really safe space to say, okay, you know, who who is going to be an affirming employer who can provide a connection where i know that my way of being as a human being is going to be um supported and welcomed and my strengths are going to be nurtured yeah feel free if you guys want to email me or you know text or call me i put my um um, phone number, uh, it's 206-550-0012 and my, um, Columbia email, which is LAZ2124 at Columbia in the chat. Um, so if you guys, uh, would ever like to reach out, you know, feel free. I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I'll have contact information in, um, in, uh, like in the last slide as well. And I'm really, please feel free to reach out to me as well. I My connections are sort of in the world of um, writing and editing, but I'm, you know, that's a really good uh, area for, for neurodivergent people quite often. So, um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, and I, I'm really heartened to see this um, group at Columbia. I think coming together in this space really shows that, um, and with all the full support of the Columbia Alumni Association with Jenna and Mari, um, and they're hosting it and everything really shows that Columbia is very um, increasingly open to supporting, welcoming, and affirming people um, with disabilities of all sorts. Um, and I hope that that's really true. Um, and And all of us being here is also something that I think bodes well for 
um, Columbia and for each of us really to have that connection. So um, this is these are just some ideas about how we can really live affirming self-advocacy and allyship so that disabled people increasingly do gain equality, equity, access, well-being, success, joy, you know, at Columbia, but also beyond. Um, uh, slide, please. So um, just um, because this is kind of an intensive talk and we bring up a lot of different topics, this is usually a time where I take like a, um, like a, you know, 10, 15 second, like deep breath, just taking a moment to kind of pause because this next section is also kind of dense. So if everybody wants to just take like a deep breath, maybe a stretch, um, I know what will help. I'm going to just show you my dog. This is a great break. He's such a grump. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> See? Okay. Dog break. And um, I know he's a real character. Um, but now we'll just, we're going to switch into the professional paradigm section, which is both for, um, thank you. <laughs> He's so cute. So this section is intended for, um, on, to, to sort of land on a couple different levels. If you yourself are a professional, if you are someone who works with professionals, um, around your own needs, if you are someone who has an interest in um, maybe influencing institutions, things like that, um, this is for you. So um, this is this is not just for professionals, though it's also for like internal shifts in the way we see some of these professional paradigms. It's not just for people who actively are working in a profession, but it's like, are you a disabled person who sees disability as a lack? Things like that, right? Um, so those are, we're just, it's a really broad shift in professional paradigms. So we, there are very pervasive ableist normative systems. There are powerful pharmaceutical and other corporate interests that all of which play a really huge role in how disability is framed in almost every related profession, right? There's a lot of money in the medicalization and diseaseification of disability. Um, but I think that the people who make up those professions and the people who, the actual real life disabled people who live their lives um, fundamentally want to foster justice and positive growth and affirming care, right? So um, we, in this meeting and with our privilege of having um, our Columbia affiliations may have some ways as professionals, as clients, as parents, as um, people affiliated with certain institutions, including Columbia, we have certain ways that we can address these systemic biases and actively create access and equality. So we can start in spaces like this, right, where we've come together to evolve and, and have this affinity together where we can um, think about and potentially brainstorm about ways that we can make Columbia a better place, make the worlds that each of us inhabit a better place. So how might um, teachers, therapists, doctors, law enforcement, and other professionals see their work if they didn't buy into these stereotypes and diseaseification of disability, if people were to shift both internal and professional paradigms around disability and diversity toward a more objective and inclusive vision. I'm gonna share um, a couple of different examples from my own life, but I'm also going to um, share some of the research from our second book today, even though it's not out yet. This is like the second or third time I've publicly shared some of this research. Um, so slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we learned from our research that um, leaning in on some um, model that does have roots in a variety of activist traditions and educational traditions, we learned that we can best serve our, our, we can best be served and best serve our clients. So when I say clients, I'm gonna use that to encompass like students, patients, 
customers, constituents, um, et cetera, by becoming mirrors in which disabled people can see their best selves and windows through which they can see possibilities and opportunities and doors enabling better access to these possibilities and opportunities. I'm gonna give um, an example from my son's special education process. The professionals involved in his special education um, had the best intentions, but we both found the system really grueling and shaming and overburdened. And I think it it really affected him pretty deeply. And yes, this had a lot to do with how his peers ostracized and shamed the kids who had to go to the special education hallway. But why did that hallway exist in the first place, right? So tip one around shifting those paradigms, and this can be extrapolated to, you know, all kinds of institutional situations is no special education hallways, right? So I obviously being autistic, I, I tend to be literal sometimes, but here I'm actually not being literal. Like the equivalent of a special education hallway is always going to be the wrong move. Um, that we should devise ways to integrate disabled students or clients into classrooms, workplaces, practices in ways that don't additionally other them, right? So um, that's why when I'm talking about like say an orientation where we we are explicit about rules and expectations to everyone, an orientation or a um, you know signs or um, in or, or websites you know that are parts of departments or things like that that explicitly state we are open to your needs. I've recently um, become the inclusion and accessibility officer at a company that I work with really regularly. And um, and and we I developed a North Star statement that's gonna be in every email and every internal email and every client facing um, communication that they have where we're like, we actively welcome the participation of all people in every activity of our business. If you have any questions or needs for adaptation or any in any, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically like, you need anything, you come to us and we will honor your needs. Um, so having that baked in rather than having it be like a special thing that's off in the dark hallway. Um, so my son's special education experience did not provide mirrors, windows and doors. He saw himself reflected as someone who needed fixing. And he looked around and felt trapped rather than being shown um, windows into opportunities. And his proposed next steps were extremely limited as compared to typical students, despite him being a super brilliant kid. Um, slide, please. So I'm gonna give another family example. Um, when you have an autistic child, everyone tells you to put them in social skills groups. So I figured, why not? Maybe he can be less awkward than me. So I signed him up for a social skills group at a local university. And for the first few weeks, I sat in the waiting room. And then one day someone beckoned me into a different area and there was a room behind the playroom with a one-way window into the play group. And this room was filled with professors and students taking notes and discussing the children in the play group as if they were study objects, not people. I was pretty overwhelmed and shocked but once I was able to process, I started emailing questions to the people who ran the program. I was like, do the kids know they're being watched like this? Because my kid didn't. And, you know, do you have explicit consent from the parents? Because I didn't notice that anywhere. And would you want to be treated like you're treating these children? And I literally got no response. I never took my son back either. But um, tip two would be like, if you're a current or future professional or you're involved in anything adjacent to this, not to treat disabled people like fish in a fish tank, right? Or as study objects, taking people's concerns seriously and doing your research ethically. Essentially that back to that same golden rule, right? Don't use the fine print to justify actions that you wouldn't want performed on you. And always ask yourself if you would be okay with um, whatever you're doing as a researcher, right? So, um, I kind of wondered about that with the Columbia study that was being shared, you know, how many of the people who were involved that there was that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk where they published this big medical study. And I thought, I wonder like how many people involved in that study really understood what they were participating in, you know, um, slide please. So 
those two examples describe professions and professionals and institutions that really adhere to othering paradigms that are that dehumanizing of people. And they also ignore basic aspects of respect that are reflected in affirming values and practices. So really nurturing, um, affirming professional practices requires a different approach and it demands new mindsets, right? Slide, please. But why not um, as professionals be, quote, the experts in informing disabled people of a better perspective about themselves? Why not frame disability as a disease or something to be fixed or cured? Well, this kind of ableism is not only biased and demeaning and discriminatory, it's really flat out incorrect, right? With 20% of humans, so that's one in five, being neurodivergent, and roughly 30% or one in three roughly being disabled, we need a much more respectful and realistic vision of the ways that varied abilities provide vital ingredients to the human mix. This picture is my family, so it's not one in five. It's pretty much everybody. Um, so I encourage you to question these discriminatory systems and consider if you have any input in the way that um, something is being designed or the way that something is being evolved, that you consider universal design approaches. So these serve everybody rather than making people beg for what they need, right? I mean, that said, it's realistic right now to assume that some institutions or government agencies require certain kinds of like labels and diagnoses and specifics to qualify for adaptations and services and resources. But um, there are a lot of other ways to kind of shift these paradigms and help people from your own professional corner of the world make disability less loaded, something that's more like your height or your address than a disease or deficit, and frame it, whatever that disability is, as useful information for gaining access to equal treatment and resources. Um, slide, please. However, in everyday professional life, Paradigm shifting isn't really necessary, necessarily encouraged, but our research has really showed that there's a dire necessity for evolution within professions. This mirror window door model invites professionals to ask generative questions and not just professionals, but you can also turn these around on professionals that you might be collaborating or engaging with or even um, getting care from, right? Can your clients or students, et cetera, remember I'm using clients to um, encompass a lot of things, can they see themselves in my field and practice, right? That doesn't just mean incorporating images and stories of intersectionality, but helping to make your profession welcoming to disabled professionals. Are we showing our clients a full range of opportunities, dreams, and goals? Are we supporting goals and options that reflect equity and access? And finally, are we actually removing barriers in our professional practice and collaboratively helping clients move toward their goals and dreams? Are we facilitating equity and access? So asking these kind of questions of your own profession or the professionals who you might be receiving care from or your family or the institutions you're involved with um, will help eradicate these harmful paradigms and practices and encourage affirming autonomy and nurture a culture of professional allyship. Slide, please. So we've talked about some important reasons to update professional paradigms, and we've looked at some great ways to interrogate whether you are truly serving your clients whole selves or if your whole self is being served or if the institutions that you're involved with are doing so. But now for some strategies, practical strategies. So our research revealed four main aspects of evolving professional cultures, language, and practices. The first is evaluating assessment. Um, I'm going to have a slide for each of these. So um, if you don't have to write it down or anything, if you're really engaged, but um, sorry, can you uh, just go back one? Thank you. So I'm going to have, <laughs> there's going to be a slide, but, but for the, um, the first one is evaluating assessment. And then there's eradicating the disease model of disability, eliminating stereotypes and actions based on stereotypes and educating law enforcement. 
which got its own category because there's there's been a lot with that recently. So evaluating assessment mm -hmm. to truly nurture disabled people's wellness, we need a fundamental shift away from assessments that pathologize up to a third of our population. So the healing and supportive professions have long operated with the understanding that there's something wrong with disabled people. And so assessments seek to demonstrate this wrongness or fix this wrongness rather than simply documenting clients' particular expression of difference or disability. So progress with assessment also entails shifting away from being sort of like the dominant knowledge holders to a more collaborative model that welcomes disabled perspectives along with affirming and disabled professionals themselves. Um, slide, please. But all of this um, paradigm shifting, all of this change depends on how you fundamentally think about disability, right? Do you feel that disability is an equally worthy way of being human? Or do you continue to think of it as an inherently negative lack or difference, right? Do you see disability as um, a problem because our societal and institutional structures are set up in ways that are disabling to us? Or do you see it as a lack or deficit, right? So there are a lot of pathologized words like deficit, able-bodied, afflicted by, suffers from, syndrome. Um, all of these are integrally linked with a disease model of disability that marginalizes and demeans us. So we can reclaim meanings like with the actually autistic hashtag that I use a lot, but it's even more vital to eradicate these underlying assumptions that cause professionals to use othering language and treat disabled people as somehow unwell. Um, these different types of care needs emerge from fundamental differences between all human beings. And so they should be treated as a neutral phenomenon. And we can use non-pathologizing language to describe the needs and the resources and our accommodations that are necessary to meet them, right? It would be so wonderful, right, if someday it was common to view things like assistive technology or truly supportive adaptations in the same way that we see sneakers as necessary for running or a bowl as the right thing to put soup in, that is as neutral aids to accomplishing a given task. Slide, please. And eliminating discriminatory stereotypes will also enable us to create new models around care, assessment, adaptations, education, and support. Progress will involve replacing negative misconceptions with awareness of neutral scientific facts about disability and proactive framing of disability as an equally valuable way of being human. And Progress will also involve the understanding that we all need a variety of adaptations. I was talking about this a little bit earlier in our environment and re relationships. So the current stigmatized stereotypes around disability are at odds with this fact. Some people need bright lights to see and others need softer lights to feel comfortable, right? Um, some people communicate using their mouth and some use assistive tech and some use both. Right. Some people take vitamins, some people take Ritalin. They're all different kind of adaptations that we live in this world that are that are simply um, the, the same on a on a fundamental level. And yet they aren't really seen as that. Um, so as professionals, I think it's really crucial to avoid basing your work on stereotypes. We all need different things. My son's teachers and paraprofessionals worked from this giant IEP folder that consisted of a lot of generic stereotypical autism strategies. And my son didn't need, really basically didn't need any of them, but this huge volume of stereotypes basically obscured what he actually needed a lot of the time, which was really challenging. So ask yourself or the professionals that you're engaging with, um, whether your profession adheres to, sorry, I'm seeing that comment, that's hilarious. Yep, yeah, why not? <laughs> um, does your profession or the professionals that you're engaging with or institutions adhere to discriminatory stereotypes? And if so, you know, also do those stereotypes include um, certain discriminatory stereotypical standards for improvement or success, right? Is there room for, 
your professional um, practice or the person you're engaging with or the institution to assume that we're valuable and whole just as we are, even as we might benefit from the areas of learning or healing or growth a certain profession might provide. Um, slide, please. Mm. And finally, we have educating law enforcement Law enforcement, um, along with discriminatory laws, was a major focus for needed change um, in our most recent book, in our survey, and in our interviews. Policing systems often perpetuate misperceptions and incorrect assumptions around disability and particularly neurodivergence. So a law enforcement officer who's not disability aware might see a disabled person as weird or off and therefore profile them. Um, and these kind of misconceptions are exacerbated for bi our BIPOC and LGBTQIA um, and other intersectional people. So we and all of our respondents, many of whom had had very bad experiences with law enforcement or had fear about them, um, really strongly support disability education for law enforcement. Um, slide, please. So I hope that you will um, able to use some of these insights around mirrors, windows, and doors, as well as um, these ideas around evolving professional cultures to move beyond and help others move beyond mere compliance and generate real evolution in these four essential areas of professional paradigms. Bearing in mind that when you shift professional paradigms, much like allyship, it should happen collaboratively with the people you're serving or allying with. Um, it really takes all of us to change these pervasive and enduring professional mindsets and social structures that underpin these systemic barriers to the success and growth and interdependence and independence of disabled people. So I'm gonna take um, questions now and then I'm going to talk just a little bit more after that, um, just to kind of wrap it up. So this will be my main Q&A. Um, and please feel free. Um, there's there's one more like um, slide with content, and then there's a contact slide. Please, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have a mailing list. I can let you know when my next book comes, um, all kinds of stuff. But um, really happy to talk further about any of the points that I've made tonight or that anyone else brings up. So any questions? No questions. That's never happened. <laughs> all right, come on, Columbia. I have a question, but I'd already asked one. So I, if nobody else has it, I want to ask you. Sure, of course. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about autistic people and academia as far as like pursuing a PhD? Because everybody growing up told me you're going to become a professor. You're going to become an academic. I have a master's, but not a PhD. And it's always in the back of my mind, you know, how, you know, would it work? Is it worth wild to do given that um often i feel like every step of the way i have to advocate specifically with you know advisors to say you know i'm not arguing with you i'm just asking for clarification now i can argue but i'm not doing that right now right yeah i mean that's a really good question because i think that um you know if you found yourself getting a master's at columbia you probably have it in you to get um, mm -hmm. to get the doctorate. I think that there are a lot of different areas that I was really unclear on when I was a grad undergraduate and graduate, but I, I was undergraduate at Bryn Mawr, so it was just so affirming, but um, Columbia was not so, so much. I hope that it's changed. Um, so I think that if you go into it, knowing that you have the academic chops then I think that the things that you may need to focus on are things that I'm trying in my work, in my most recent book, for example, to, to surface, to make more obvious like what those things might be. So like some of the things might be that you have sensory needs or some of them might be that you, that you need more time or you need to be able to do certain things such as tests in a different environment, right? To, to come to the table knowing what some of those things might be is one thing. And then the other thing is 
to come to the table knowing, and this, again, this is if you want to actually pursue this, right? Knowing that there might be things that you don't know that, that you might need um, an, an ally to um, walk you through. Like, for example, like I said, like I was not deferential at all. And it might have helped me in the program to know that you were supposed to be deferential or or maybe to be to have known that solidly that I was autistic and to be able to say, I'm autistic. I'm going to need you to be very clear with me about, um, you know, unspoken um, norms that are going on right now in this interaction. You know, I mean, at least you'll know in most doctoral programs that the people who are involved in them are kind of eggheads and they'll at least maybe understand your language. Some some um, some academic fields have lots of autistic people, um, but I don't. Th I I think uh, not journalism or sociology necessarily. So, I mean, I'm being I might be being stereotypical, and I don't mean to do that at all. I just know that no, I have friends. Right. It, it, sorry, it is my experience that I only I mean, I've only known a couple other of like. I was at Columbia's part-time master's journalism program. So mm -hmm. I got to know two one-year cohorts yeah. and there were only a couple of people, one who told me later that they'd been diagnosed and one that I highly suspected was yeah. um, on the spectrum. So yeah, it was, and most people were pretty open with me because I started the uh, Alliance of Journalists with Disabilities. So, you know, right. if anybody would know, they would come to me, but I, I didn't really see a lot of autistic people occupying, you know, the journalism space. Right, right. And and I have friends who went into the sciences who, you know, half the people they work with are openly autistic. And I don't I don't know that that does kind of fit in with like a stereotypical vision of this, which I'm not trying to promote at all. I just know like in sociology, no, it wasn't like a common thing at all. Um, but I think I do think that a lot of Academia, like many workplaces, is very much about navigating this, um, you know, this sort of hierarchical structure or or um, playing the game right, which I can't really offer advice on. I just always sort of just kept working as hard as I could and producing the best work that I possibly could, and and I don't I don't know if that, you know, if you might find like I ultimately um found I did teach at community college for a decade but I it was um I was very very broke and with no job security or anything so I was very idealistic but it took me a while to figure out whoa whoa wait this is not <laughs> can't support my family this way so I found that I was able to um kind of use my academic skills in my writing um and editing to develop a career that suited me better which um as an introvert and um, someone who does not, even to this day, as much as I have learned, I still suspect I really don't do well with corporate and institutional dynamics. So for me, I can interact mostly in writing with people and um, and and I am open about my neurology now. Um, so that works well for me. I, I don't know how I would have ended up in academia, um, but we can certainly try to network and figure out, you know, what you know get people's impressions on that you know i appreciate that yeah, yeah. alice has her hand raised again mm -hmm. um thank you so much for just a really awesome presentation oh thank you. um one question which because you mentioned like removing some of the medical stigma um yeah. but that and but then there's also the need for accommodations and i'm wondering what your thoughts are on balancing um ideas and yeah. you know the different narratives around each mm -hmm. of those because right. that's a great question yeah. um it's something that i have a whole other talk that i've done that i do on but very briefly i'll say obviously there's sort of a reality where in certain settings whether they're mostly institutional or governmental governmental settings you need to have your diagnosis to receive certain um, benefits. Now, part of my work is to try not see those things as benefits in any, anymore and try to move more toward a universal design model. Um, but I think that that's definitely still a reality that we need to take into account. The other side of that is that I found um, knowing I was autistic, so, so looking at diagnosis from a slightly different perspective, um, that knowing that 
that I was autistic gave me a lot of tools and a lot of insights and explanations for things that I hadn't understood previously. So I'm not like anti-diagnosis. I would like to come up with a different word for it. And I would like to see society more broadly, um, you know, embrace serving the needs of all students, patients, clients, et cetera. But I know we've, we've obviously got a ways to go for that. So I think that, you know, like something that I've done is um, work with medical practices that my kids have been involved in or um, other institutions that I've been involved with to try to begin to, to nudge the language away from pathologizing language. Um, while looking at diagnoses as, like I was saying before, like sneakers, you know, like, can we, can we make this, um, these things more neutral and just, um, you ut almost utilitarian and neutral, you know, um, I think we've got a, a long way to go in all those things, but obviously I, I, right now we still need a lot of these tools that come out of a diagnosis. Does that answer your question, Alice? Does that help? Um, yes, but yeah. it also sort of raises another one which has been coming up for me throughout your talk uh, which has been just awesome uh but so what about when people don't understand what their needs are because you mentioned okay. having a diagnosis is different but i've been interviewing people and one thing that's really interesting is because we only know our own experience so i spoke with several people who had prosopagnosia or were yeah. diagnosed but they like yeah. they see the parts of faces that they see so it never occurred to them that people experience oh. faces differently yeah. So or they we only have one minute disorder. left, Alice. So I want to I want to answer this really quickly. I'm sorry, really sorry to interrupt you. I just I know I want to be mindful of people's time, and we literally have one minute left. I have two more slides. So I'm going to say, very true, absolutely. That's a concern. That's one of the reasons that we wrote the book that we just wrote, the uh, actually autistic guide to building independence, because we try to figure out what are all the, all the different things that you that um that might come up obviously it's just one book and they they made us cut like 100 pages so um you know we it's true that we don't know what we don't know absolutely i didn't even realize that everybody couldn't recognize faces until my son couldn't recognize me at all and his prosopagnosia is a little worse than mine so or a little more extreme than mine so you know we there are a lot of things that we don't know that we don't know and that's really a thing and i think that that's where communicating and collaborating with other people can be really helpful um and that's where we were we, we were trying to go with this book and I think that's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I want to just wrap up, uh, really quickly mm -hmm. say that, um, I've really integrated as many perspectives into this talk as I could come up with, but someone's always going to have another question, right? Say I missed this or that. And that's the point. It's actually the point speaking to your question, Alice, like what I'm talking about is kind of like a supple cultural shift a shift toward a way more inclusive model that's also adaptive to each situation um, and constantly evolving. So if we know we want to live in an ever more affirming world, then we welcome all those other perspectives and the chance to grow. And we follow that intersectional golden rule and we're empowered as self-advocates. And as allies, we um, learn and listen and then act with not for, right? So, um, I hope that you'll use this new connection, this new group as an opportunity to connect with like-minded people. And um, we, we can all bring uh, some movement towards shifting paradigms together. Um, can you shift to the last slide, please, really briefly? And I just, that's what I just said. And then the final slide has all of my contact information. So. Yeah, um, it looks like it's a little cut off, but um, my email, I'm gonna put it in the chat. You can also just email me if you want to be on my mailing list or get in touch with me about anything regarding this. Okay. Um, were there any other questions before I, that's that's all I have to say, but I, I just wanna make sure that I, I got all the questions looking in the chat. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so, so much, everybody. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking. We really, really, really appreciate it. And um, 
I just wanted to say every to everybody, um, you know, those who are here now, those who came earlier and those who may watch the recording a little bit later, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for coming. And if you want to get in contact with me, once again, it's L-A-Z, my first, middle, and last initial, 2124 at columbia.edu. Yeah, like thank you very much. Can I say mine too? Because I just put it in the chat, but if someone's watching the recording, they won't have access to that. Yeah, okay. sounds good. So, so my my email is J I N as in Nancy, E, F as in Frank, F as in Frank, A, B as in boy, L E at gmail.com. Yeah, and you can also, if you want to give me a call, I actually like phone conversation. I know some autistic people don't, but I love to chat on the phone. So it's 206-550-0012. That's 206-550-0012. I know that either extreme not wanting to chat at all or loving to chat can both be signs of autism. I'm the extreme <laughs> opposite. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.